Good morning. If you're planning to write any letters over the weekend, don't. That's the feeling I've got about the continuing crisis in Canada's postal system. And I think I might be right if I said that the average member of the public is sick and tired and absolutely fed up with the frustrations and confusions about the postal strike, the possible postal strike. At this very moment, in Ottawa, Gilles Lamontagne and the rest of the Liberal cabinet are trying to decide what to do. Maybe you don't know some of the basic facts. The Postal, the Cup W people have not had a contract since June 1930, June 30, 1977. They will, they haven't had a contract since then. They haven't had a wage increase since July 1976. The government talks out of both sides of its mouth on the formation of a Crown Corporation. The union, as I think we'll find this morning, doesn't know what that Crown Corporation will mean when it comes to taking over the post office. And the nation, when it's interested, is sick and tired of the whole affair. With me this morning, I've got Frank Walden. Frank, is that too rough an introduction? No, <laughs> Frank not rough Wal enough. <laughs> Frank Walden is the National Director for Western Canada of Cup. W, Canadian Union of Postal Workers. And with them is Lloyd Ingram, who is president of the Vancouver local of dear old Cup W. And I'm going to be back hammering at both of them, and you'll have your chance to in a minute or two. Bring it in to me. Mr. Ingram, what, Mr. what local are you president? Vancouver local. Vancouver. Make sure the V4s are right. Vancouver. Lloyd Ingram, president, Vancouver local. Cup W. And Frank Walden, national director for Western Canada. Right? Right. You got all that, you do? Right. You got to go in rough on these things, you know. See back on camera one. National Director. National Director, Western Region, that's right. Yeah. That's close enough. Yeah. Yeah. All right, good. Thirty seconds. Oh, to government ever results. Frank Walden, I'm presuming that a strike is now unstoppable and will start as soon as you've counted the ballots for the whole of the nation sometime on Monday. What's your gut? information on that frank well the ball the ballots will be in uh on sunday night the uh national executive board will announce the results in a press conference around 11 o'clock ottawa time um, i expect to be called into ottawa <coughs> either monday or tuesday for the board to uh call the uh, strike or set the date for the strike all right just let me get that timing right uh, how about the voting, say, Lloyd, for the Vancouver local? When do they vote, or have they already voted? They vote at 1 p.m. on Sunday here in Vancouver. And everybody will have voted by then? Everybody will have voted by Sunday evening. Or is that everybody will have voted, or everybody who wants to vote will have voted? You're right, everybody who wants to vote. What kind of turnout do you think you'll get, 50%? Oh, I expect much more here in Vancouver. Oh. I expect at least 75%, possibly 80 or 90%. And how's it going to go? How do you want it to go, Lloyd Ingram? How do I want it to go? Yeah. Me, personally, yeah. I want to vote for strike. The membership will make up their own minds. Uh, the feeling I get is we're going to get about 85 to 90 percent for strike. For strike. No yes. doubt. In, that's what you want to see, and that's what you think will happen. That's what I think Is it happen. fair to put that same question to you as the, as the National Director for Western Region? You've been traveling all over the country. <laughs> like a, a devil on horseback, haven't you? From here to Winnipeg. From here to Winnipeg, right. And what do you tell them? What have you been telling them about the vote, Frank? Well, the National Executive Board unanimously recommends to the membership to vote yes for a strike action for the simple reason that Cordemont's report can, is totally incomplete. It contains nothing there for a settlement or any recommendations to the 
to the two parties. I want to get the timing right, Frank, though. Now, the results of the end, uh, Ottawa by Sunday night. Sunday night, that's right. The National Board will meet sometime on Monday. Monday or Tuesday. Monday or positive, Tuesday. Yeah. So then you'll set your decision. Uh, the National Board will make the timing of the strike if it goes that way, which you expect. And you could be out when? You could be out Tuesday, Wednesday? That's, that's right. That's a possibility. We could be out Tuesday or Wednesday. And that's what you'd like to see, as a matter of fact. Well, that definitely, because the, the report, there's nothing in it. They have refused to negotiate with us. The only time that this employer of ours will negotiate with us is after they've had a strike mandate and a threatening of a strike. But you see, you're an essential public service. You shouldn't have the right to strike anyway, you, the postal workers. Isn't that what the government tells you and what the man on the street might say? That's what they may say, but we are workers just like everybody else, and we were given that right under the Public Service Staff Relations Act to take strike action against our employer, and that's what we will do if they don't bargain with us. In other words, they gave you the right to strike, now they want to cut your throat on it. Well, they've been cutting our throat for years, so that's nothing new. Now, um, you've had Lamontagne, you've had the threats. Uh, Trudeau says this morning, it's just a new thing in on the wire. Government officials will meet representatives of QP this afternoon in Ottawa. Is there any sense in that at this particular stage of the day? Well, we, we have told them that we are prepared to uh, meet with them if they are, want to go into true negotiations. We mean true negotiations where they'll do something. But we're not going to go through another session of 18 months or, or any months uh, if they're not going to be productive negotiations. Look, in case I confuse people, I just want to check my fact. Your contract actually expired when? June the 30th, 1977. And you've been negotiating since then? Uh, and we, yes, we started negotiations before that. That's a full 18 months you've been negotiating. That's right. And the last wage increase you got when? It was in July, 1976. Are you people overpaid and underworked? <laughs> overpaid? And we're underworked. Not, we're not overpaid, that's for sure. How about it? Do you actually work in the office or are you a full-time union official, Lloyd? I'm a full-time union official, but I've only been a full-time union official since January of last year. I haven't had a year in yet. And you really feel there's resentment against wages and working conditions, and I want to come to that ad the government ran. Mm -hmm. Now, what about the back-to-work order? Lamontan has been saying we're not going to allow a strike, and there's been other talks and threats and whatnot. How do you regard these threats from the government? Is it deadly serious? Um, Personally, I don't uh, take them deadly serious, but anything's possible from the government. Uh, we have never had uh, any legislation uh, put against us in my 30 years in the government service, and uh, this will be something new if they do. Uh, but well, remember the big strike in '75. You were out for 42 days. That's Would right. You, you weren't ordered back to work on that one. No, we're not. There was no legislation or anything against us there. Did you win or lose that one in 75? We, we, we gained a heck of a lot in that one. And you're prepared to go out? How long would you stay out this time? Back to work order or not? Well, that depends on the membership. That depends on the militancy of the membership. Right at the moment, the membership are real high. They're, they're fed up with 18 months of negotiations. Of all the meetings that I have attended, and I have had six meetings in the last three days, the membership there are fed up uh, uh, with the report. There's nothing in the report, and uh, they're high right now. They're ready to go. Now, uh, this Cotemans report we've got to talk about in a minute or two. Uh, what, uh, what kind of wages do you get right now in the post office? Is it possible to tell me, you know, so that the man so out there watching the television could say, my goodness gracious me, or words to that effect, mm -hmm. they are underpaid. I mean, what's so bad about it? Okay, the top rate for an inside worker, that's a mail dispatcher, is six thirty-eight. Uh, the bottom rate, I believe, right now is six dollars and thirteen cents. That's for uh, a PO two, which is a mail handler. Correct me if I'm wrong in that bottom rate, Frank. Pretty close to that. Six yes. six oh one. Six oh one bottom rate. Yeah, but it's not generally the money you people uh, seem to fight about in the Vancouver local. It seems to be oppressive supervision. Now, don't let me put words in mm -hmm. your mouth. Is it bad management, p apart from the technological change, which is your biggest problem? Certainly, there, there's bad management. Uh, what we, the problems we have in Vancouver, I don't know how familiar you are with the Vancouver Post Office. I just know how long it takes to get a letter sometimes. Right. Well, I asked a member of the press the other day if he'd been ever in the Vancouver Post Office, and he said only to buy a 14-cent stamp. 
Right. Well, the Vancouver Post Office is not the lobby where you buy your stamps. Today, it's not the Vancouver Post Office. It's the Vancouver Mail Processing Plant. It's a factory. And the public have not been in there. I just wish they would allow them in for a look. Yeah, but you can't escape this uh, technological change, this automation, can you? We're not, we're not opposing the, uh, the mechanization, Jack. We're, what we're saying, that we want the adverse effects taken away out of the, the mechanization, and we want a share of the benefits on it. You mean you want shorter work and more money? Which may well be reasonable, but that's basically your objective. That's basically, but also the working conditions. Well, uh, that's get, the big fact, one of the big factors. Working conditions we'll talk about in a minute. But let's talk about job security. Do you not now have a kind of cast iron job security contract? No. Well, that's the impression you get. Correct me, correct me. Because, because what's happening right now, we're having uh, people released um, under a term that we use, so it is Section 31. This is for discipline, uh, for abuse of sick leave, uh, um, if your production's not up and that, we're having more people released out of the post office than we have ever had in our history before. Every one of these things goes to a grievance, I presume. Oh, yes. How many grievances have you got going on the Vancouver local? In Vancouver, I think we average about uh, 10 to 15 a week. But nationally, uh -huh. there's, fi been, there's 56,000 grievances at the third level of the grievance. Now, there are six major locals out right now this morning. Why hasn't the Vancouver, or why hasn't the Western region gone out in advance? Like because the most, other six places. most of the locals that are out right at the moment are over local problems. Uh -huh. Okay, they've gone out. There has not been a national call. And that I would hope that in the Western region, the locals would wait until there is a national call for unity. But the locals that have been out right at the present time are over local problems. Mm -hmm. So you don't expect any wildcat action in British Columbia or Western Canada. You expect the proper legal action after the votes are counted Sunday night well, in Ottawa. Well, there is problems in Calgary right now. I left there oh, yeah. last night at 11 o'clock. They were out then? And no, they will be out today, some of them there. But they've got problems with management there, harassment tactics, uh, picking on people, you know, chasing young girls around. Uh, in the chasing them around office. just to do the work, I presume? No, chasing them around and disciplining them. Oh. So uh, this is the case in Calgary, and they'll be out because of the bad management in that plant. Okay, next we're going to look at uh, the, what you want and what they've offered. We'll talk about this court to manage report with uh, Frank Walden and Lloyd Ingram of Cup W. And drop you it can again. Ask for the change if you want. Yeah, okay. Jack will ask for the no, I just wound it up briefly. Okay. Don't uh, worry, just do it brief. Again, then I'll ask for the next one. Now, Frank, the union, the, the, the post office has got lots of taxpayers' money to present their case, and you've got lots of money to present your case, right? Well, we got money, yes. Okay, there was a big ad in all the papers in Western, all, all across the country the other day, and I want to take that ad bit by bit, and you tell me what's right and what's wrong. First of all, hours of work. Now, the position is that the employer wants you to work a 40-hour week for 40-hour pay, and you apparently want a 30-hour week for 40 hour pay, with 18 hours for wash up periods, breaks and lunch periods. Okay, take it away. What's the situation? Is it correct that you're actually asking for a 30 hour week for 40 hour pay? Well, the first thing, Jack, that I want to say about this newspaper ad is, 
that I condemn this employer of ours for negotiating with the general public and not negotiating with us. They have not negotiated us with eight, for 18 months, but now they turn around and spend millions of dollars of the general public's money to put an ad in here to negotiate with the general public. And I condemn this government for that attitude. You see, now, is back it, to your question. But before you come to that, is this a wrong misrepresentation of the actual position? I mean, is that, is that untrue? That's untrue. That's untrue. The government ads are twisted against you. It's the same thing as they put out a, a pamphlet, a dialogue to every every employee in the post office, negotiating directly with the employers and not with the negotiating team. If that's the kind of tactics that this government and, and the employer are doing, then no wonder they're going to get themselves into trouble and into a strike action. But maybe that employs the union officials more than employs the uh, annoys the union officials more than annoys the postal workers. No, it, it annoys the the workers. All ever right. since the workers have seen these ads. Cook Demanche is this young law professor who did the conciliation board report. That was a disaster, right? It's a complete disaster. Okay. Now they say they want to give you forty hour work week for forty hour pay, including two and a half hours for wash up periods and breaks. That's an accurate representation of their position. Of their position. They have never put any position before the negotiating team in regards to hours of work. Now, what's your position? What do you if, want? If the employer wants to offer us 30 hours, if that's they're doing all the talking about the 30 hours, then we'll gladly accept it if they want to offer it to oh, us. Now, Frank, don't, don't, don't. This says here that the union has asked for a 30-hour work week for 40-hour pays, including 18 hours for wash-up periods. Okay. Did you ask for that? Jack, you know that in negotiations, you do not say that you want 37 or 35 hours. You set a negotiable figure. The negotiable figure that we set at was 30 hours, okay? Now we'll go into negotiations and negotiate with the employer a figure to come up with something less than 40 hours. What, what you're telling me is that they know perfectly well that you'll settle for a lot less than that. It's a negotiable figure, yes. What did Kurtemans recommend on the hours He recommended of work? nothing on ours. He referred it back to the parties. He didn't come down or up an inch at all, any way, he, didn't, he didn't make any recommendation on the hours of work. Ideally, therefore, you would like a 30-hour week, including 18 hours for wash-up periods, breaks, and lunch periods. Ideally. That is only a negotiable figure. In other words, you don't expect to get that. No, absolutely not. Let's put it this way. There is other federal government employees working for 37 and a half hours a week now. The government, uh, the British government post office employees work less than f 40 hours a week. I think they're at 37 and a half too. Mm -hmm. So that you can give you some idea what direction we're heading. All in. right, let's look at wages now. Wages. It says they've offered you a total increase of $1.01 an hour, including 41 cents in hourly wages plus 60 cents per hour cost of living allowance. That includes that. That will bring you up to 7.76 an hour for a 40-hour week. And you allegedly want a basic wage rate of $11 an hour before premiums and COLA, an increase of $1.11 per hour plus unlimited cost of living allowance. Well, that's the same story then, is it? Okay, that's, that's the same story. Okay, the, the wage offer that the, that the uh, employer, and he never put it before negotiations, what the employer did in the closed sessions of the conciliation board report, handed a piece of paper with a wage rate on it to Cordemont's, the chairman, who presented it to the union. That's how they went about it. The, the rate of money was 41 cents. There is nothing about the cola in there. Now, I want to get the, the, this straight on the COLA. Yeah, I'd like to understand okay. that. Okay, the COLA. We have no control over the COLA. The only wage that we're guaranteed is the hourly rate negotiated in the collective agreement. Whatever the COLA is, we're asking right at the moment, one cent for 0.3 of the consumer price index set on 1961 cost of living basis. They want to move it to 1971. But everybody, the public has to realize, everybody has to realize, we have no control over the COLA. The employer is using $1,000, 60, 60 cents an hour for COLA. The COLA is based on the inflation in Canada. If it goes up, the COLA goes up. 
But if the cola goes down, so does the, uh, you know, so does the money go what down. What are you telling me there for the, their actual offer is for 41 cent an hour increase in basic wage. That's right. Plus a cola, which they estimate at 60 cents an hour. How can they estimate it? Even if the economics people in Canada don't even know what the inflation rate in Canada is going to be one month from the next. All right, the government ad says, and it's a government ad, uh, the Canadian taxpayer should not be asked to pay more. This is what they say. They, they accuse you of going for a wage rate of $11 per hour and cola. That's another misrepresentation. That's absolutely, that's their figures, that's working based, off their figures. And that's based on 30 hours a week. That's based on 30 hours. Which yeah. they know perfectly well you're not going to get and they're not going to give. Okay, that's based on 30 hours a, w a week. That's based on top salary, uh -huh. okay? And that's the you that you're working nights, uh, you're working the differentials, and you're getting the cola. They're working it out on everything. Yeah. Do you know that in most of the post offices, Vancouver, Edmonton, and Calgary, we still got a 50% turnover? Didn't realize that. 50% turnover. You're telling me every second employee quits in a year? That's right. What are the conditions that make that so bad? Is it the same in Vancouver or not quite as bad? Well, it was really bad in Vancouver. I think it's coming down, and the reason it's come down, of course, has nothing to do with the post office. It has to do with the economic situation in Canada. But, ah, aha. but at the same time, people are constantly phoning our union office in Vancouver and talking about leaving the post office, and they want to know when the contract will be signed. They're anxious to get out of that place. They can't take any more of it. It's really the working conditions that they can't take. What you're telling me is that the turnover has slackened off because of the million unemployed in the country and people are sticking, whereas in times of full employment, they wouldn't touch it with a barge pole. Exactly. They just wouldn't touch it. Mm -hmm. That's a, it says here, though, I want to go back to this again. Mm -hmm. When all their business, they go to 17000 a year plus premiums and overtime. That's garbage. That's garbage. Well, uh, I suppose they're entitled to use the taxpayers' money because they take your most extreme position, build up on that to make you look like a bunch of nits. That's right. That's right. You know, and, and it, if anybody wants to believe that, then they'll believe anything. Yeah, well, I think most people know that uh, this is a tribal dance being indulged in by both yourselves and the post office. Now, the Cotemont report. That was a conciliation board report not binding on the parties. That's right. Was there anything in the Court de Manche report which you could reasonably accept? Well, there's a few minor changes in, uh, in uh, the working uh, conditions, such as uh, bidding on shifts and that, but that's all. There's nothing else in, it, all in right. the report. Well, let's get, go to this dreadful thing. Let's call it automation, not technological change. Is that, does that make working conditions loud intolerable? Is it, uh, are the men against the machine? Are the men and women against the machines? Certainly not. They're not against the machine, but th they want to have uh, at least a decent place to work. If you were to go down to the Vancouver Mail Processing Plant, as it's now called, and watch what happened when they moved the city sortation from the third floor of that plant up to the fourth floor mm -hmm. and saw people working, sorting mail in cases, with lights strung up like a Christmas tree light that they have to work under. I went in there and I talked to the people working there, and I looked, and it's damned hard to read those letters. But you're not complaining about harassment in the, in the BC operation, the Vancouver operations, are you? No harassment? I, oh, there's certain, uh, certainly there's harassment. I mean, do you, have to, do you have to produce a certain number of letters or activities at a certain time? I remember being told about that before. We have Speed no, up. Speed no up. work no work measurement for groups of less than 10 people, but the employer finds ways and means of doing it. Mm -hmm. There's always ways of doing it. Give me one sentence on job security. What job security do you have now under the old contract which expired way back in June 30, 77? Job security. Well, the jobs on job security, they said that there, there would be uh, nobody laid off uh, under technological change only through attrition. Well, I saw Lamontan saying that. We've guaranteed, he said, everybody a job in the post office is now working there. What's that effect? Don't you accept that? Okay, we, we may be able to accept that, but they have other means of getting rid of the people, Jack. In other words, there's more than one way to skin a cat. Absolutely. Well, well let's see what the, the public might want to do with your cat this morning. They might be on your side, <laughs> which is unlikely, I suppose, <laughs> but it might be against you. Uh, with Frank Walden and Lloyd Ingram of Cup W.
You know, my own personal attitude, Frank, I used to be a left winger, I'm gradually drifting to the right as I get older, most of us do, <laughs> was that essential services should not be allowed to strike. And the post office is life and death to the small businessman especially, isn't it? Oh, I, I agree with you, Jack. Yes, the, the, it's life and death for the small business. Isn't that a right? danger that, you, that you'll all lamentan and the union will cut the whole postal system's throat and will finish up with private deliveries throughout the country? You think that could happen? I, no, personally, I don't think it could happen. But the thing is that somewhere along the line, that uh, we, you know, the union this time in negotiations, we have done everything possible to avoid a strike. We have put out one of the best documentations that any union has ever put out in Canada in, in regards to our negotiations. And along comes this ad and, and cuts the feet from you. Uh, yeah, along comes uh, that. Just a minute. Uh, Who ad. gave you the right to strike? The government did. Which government gave you the right to strike? Which the Liberal government? government. Liberal government, yes, that's and right. When they brought in the Public Service Staff Relations Act, you had a choice to go mediab or strike. That's right. You took that choice to go strike. strike. And that was freely given to you by the Liberal government. Right. That's quite clear, isn't it? Yep. Now they, want to, now they just want it to take it away when the election's coming up. <laughs> eh? I'm going to go to the phones. We'll maybe talk a little bit more about Kurt Demans later. Uh, go ahead, please. Yes. Webster? Yes, yes. I'm not Oh, saying. just a minute. Hold on, hold on. I made a mistake, didn't I, Linda? Go ahead, please. Hello? Ah, come on, work. Nobody there, Linda. Go, go ahead, please. Hello, I'd like to talk to Frank, please. Go ahead to Frank. Let's, let's re-educate people that when I say go ahead, don't, you don't have to say I want to talk to Frank, or are you there, Jack, or are you there, Frank? Just go right at him. Go ahead. Hello? Hello? Yes, I don't know if it's me or not. I want to say I'm a Surrey employee, an inside worker, and I don't believe in strikes, but I certainly do believe in this one. I'm sick to death of management's propaganda that we've been getting. Got off work at 8 o'clock this morning, and here they are still handing us out pamphlets. I just want to say I'm behind our union 100%. Who's handing you out pamphlets? Management, supervisors, oh, as we're getting off work at 5 to 8 this morning. You mean the dialogue pamphlet? Yeah, I haven't even read it. I threw it in the garbage. You mean they've got supervisors standing there before you go to vote tomorrow handing you out the government position? That's right. I didn't even look at it. I threw it in the garbage. They did the same thing to us two weeks ago. How do you like that, do I? In the garbage, too. How do I like it? Mm. I don't like it. Mind you, they're fighting for their existence, too, aren't they? With the supervisors? Yeah. Like hell. But we win. They also win. They've always rode on our shirt tails. Mm -hmm. Thanks, ma'am. Go ahead, please. Hello, Jack. That's you. Um, I'd like to direct this to Lloyd. Uh, the postal people in Vancouver don't help their image any. For example, you can walk into a certain restaurant here in the West End. There's anywhere from 10 to 20 of them sitting there for over an hour with their mail bags. You can go into any of the beer parlors in the West End. They're there in uniform. Is that you or is that the letter carriers? That's the Letter Carriers Union of Canada. They deliver the mail. We sort the mail inside the post office. And they're not in a strike position at the moment at all? No, They've accepted settled. a contract. Yeah, well, they strike much less than you do, don't they? Yes, they do. Yeah. Do they write in your shirt tails too, Lloyd? Image. I certainly think so. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Yeah, I'm against post office strike altogether. Are you a worker or a public? No, I'm a public, and I'm against it altogether because I worked for the post office about uh, four or five years ago, and I'm against it because I feel that... Uh, we're paying the taxes on their on their uh, wages and everything else, and I think we're again. How old are you? I'm 29. Good boy, thank you. Go ahead, please. Jack, I'm right with you. I want to direct this. Well, I don't know where I am, to be quite honest, in this particular situation, but please direct the question. Yes, you go ahead. Right. I want to direct this as a message to the country, not to the two gentlemen that you have with you. In the midst of all this talk on the right to strike, and all the question Go on. and all the question of whether an organization has a right to strike or not a right to strike, the strikers themselves are destroying the country of Canada. It is an absolute disgrace. If these people do not wish to work, 
then out with the whole lot of them. Fire the lot. Frank, do you out. feel like, just a minute, do you feel like a saboteur lot. trying to destroy this country, Frank? No, I do not. Do you lie? No, I certainly don't. I think I'm doing as much as any Canadian to give mail service to the public. Yeah, well, of course, don't forget the government gave you the right to strike. Absolutely. You got the choice and you took it. Well, they wanted to take it away. They've got to face repercussions. Okay, where shall I go now, Linda? Which one? The bottom one? Uh, just a moment, please. I'm not really very cute at this phone system yet, but I'm getting there. From Nelson, go ahead, please. Hello. Yeah, are you talking to me? I'm talking to you. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, speak up. Oh, yeah. Um, how come these guys are always screaming for more money and the service keeps getting worse? When the mail first started way back, 1800 and something. When did you stop beating your wife, Frank? Hey? Eh? I'm asking Frank when he stopped beating his <laughs> wife. Tell me, is there, I can put a good question from that to you. Is the service getting worse? I certainly think so. As because a member of the public, I think it's getting worse. And I'm a jury night, how long it takes you to get a letter at home? That's right. What do you think, Frank? Absolutely. It's getting worse. Okay, dokie. Um, one, two, three. Go ahead, please. Hello. Yes, ma'am. I am a Fraser Valley local member, and I just want the public to know that we are sick and tired of what the union is doing, and that out of 18 out of 22 of us members, we, every one of us plan on crossing picket lines, and we want the public to know that not each and every single postal employee is as rotten as everybody thinks we are. Do you want a question, or do you want a question, in fact? No, I don't want a question. Well, I'll question it. How long you watch for the post office? Two years. Two years. What money are you making? I make $6.20 an hour. Are uh, your husband working? No, I'm a single learner myself. You're a single one yourself. Yeah, Which office are you talking about? Pardon? Which office are you talking about? Which office am I talking about? Yeah. I can't say. Oh, well, uh, 22 of them and 18 of you have met and decided to cross the picket lines if there's a strike. 18 of us are crossing, no matter what happens. What will happen to them if they cross the picket line, Frank? I mean, taking it as hypothetically correct. Under the, under the National Constitution, they can be charged. Unlikely, but they can be charged. Yes. You didn't charge them the last time for crossing picket lines, did you? Oh, yes, we did. You did? What did yes. they do to us? Do you have a closed shop agreement? No, it's on a RAND formula. The RAND formula. Thank you, ma'am. We'll watch for you in Surrey. Go ahead, please. Is that me? That's you. I'm sorry, I've got a cold, but I'll do my best. Uh, my, uh, I'm addressing this to Frank. Frank, my heart bleeds for you and the postal workers. Uh, they approximately earn, the lowest pay would be about 250 a week, right? 250 a week? Yes. No. Uh, approximately $50. Uh, a, single, a single person with all the deductions off, not, in, not including if they got bonds or anything, will take home $354 every two weeks. Well, you know, I, I always felt that if my job was too hard for me, instead of uh, sabotaging in the country, I think you should get out of, the, they should leave their jobs and give them to someone who would appreciate it and maybe hand, hand well, better service to them. Frank, the do you think there's a new generation growing up here who don't appreciate a union's functional position in industry or in government? Well, there is, there is uh, a small group, yes, that, that's going that way. At one time you had like a, to work. Uh, yeah, at one time you had a very, you know, fairly loud little collection of, uh, well, I used to call them Maoists in your local. Do you still have them, or is it under fairly solid control of the normal union person? Jack, when a person applies for membership in the Vancouver local of CUPW, we don't ask their political affiliation. That's uh, taking off my nose, in other words. It's none of my business. Exactly. It isn't mine either. Yeah, except if you have some trouble on a picket line, which you had a couple of years ago. The trouble we have on the picket line is usually caused by emotional people both on the side of management, uh, general public, and our members. Yeah, and you get some infiltrators on your picket lines too, if I recall, from other organizations. That has happened. Yes, yeah, certainly has. Go ahead, please. Where are you? Yeah, hi. Uh, the one question I want to ask is, why must a person receive so many damaged goods? Why what? Why must a person, as myself, no, ma'am, you're not on the topic. You'll have to ask the Vancouver no, no, Post no, Office no, about that. I'm not talking. Oh, what are you saying is the postal workers deliberately damage goods in transit? I don't think that's a fair question. How can the public feel sorry for them? When you get damaged goods. No, ma'am, that's not on the topic at all. I don't regard it as on the topic. Go ahead, please. What are you? Yes, I'm a member of Cup W, and through all the talk that I've heard, this is Frank. I have uh, never 
wants her any sign say the duty deal we get every time they settle the contract. We do not get retroactive pay on every hour we have put in. All we get is a lump settlement that the government agrees to give us. Oh, now, hold on. I'll take that from Frank. The quality of your line isn't too good. She's saying, I presume that if you settle the contract now, going right back question. to June the 30th, 1977, that you'll get retroactive pay on all Tell hours it. and overtime due to you. Definitely. We're, w that's what we're asking for this time. We have notified the employer right at the very beginning of negotiations that they better keep track of all the hours of overtime and everything from the end of the collective agreement because that's when, what we want the retroactive pay to be for. You mean on some other occasion they just gave you an agreed a lump, a lump sum, sum, which they decided? No, uh, they, well, yes, they decided and they were offered. Okay, now on, on, on the back-to-work legislation, what is your personal opinion? Do you think that to make itself look good in the by-elections which are coming up next week, that they will bring in emergency legislation to put well, you back to work? Give me your own private opinion, okay. Frank. My own personal opinion, and I, I feel that they, they will not uh, bring in legislation. Uh, if they do, uh, what they're doing is after they have given us the, the right to strike, and now they're going to single out 23,000 federal civil servants and say, you people cannot have the right to strike. Now, if I, you... I would I myself personally feel that if they were to do that, that they would be going against the human rights bill against 23,000 workers. Yeah, they brought it in in the first place. Now, if you become a crown corporation, which is what they'd say will make it efficient, You'd come out from under the Civil Service, Public Service Staff Relations Act, That's and right. you'd come right under the Canada Labour Code. That's what we want. We want to come under the Canada Labour Code. That's what we spent our $100,000 campaign on last year uh, for, for us to come under the Canada Labour Code under a Crown Corporation. Mind you, if there was a Crown Corporation, that would mean new management throughout, wouldn't it? Not necessarily. Would it actually improve the mail service and improve the service to the public? Well, that's going to depend on the government, on what type of Crown Corporation they bring in, on exactly what uh, the lines of authority as far as management are concerned, if they just make the switch over and, and leave the same people to do the managing, I okay. don't think it will. Okay, I'm going to try a few more phone calls on the point uh, to Frank Walden and Lloyd Ingham. Hello there. You're from Nelson. I'll put you on next. Are you on the topic? Uh, good. I'll use you next. Don't go away. The phones are all... Where are you speaking from? Are you on the topic? You're not talking about your slow mail, are you? Are you... Are you you're talking about slow mail? Don't want to talk about slow mail. I want to talk about the union contract. Call me again sometime. Are you on the topic? No, but I, do you want to talk to Walden and Ingram, or do you want to talk about... What about? I'll try and use you. Hold, hold on, I'll try and use you. Are you there? Are you on the topic? Are you a Cup W person? Hold on, I'll use you second. Are you there? Don't go away. Hold on, I'll use you as a third call. Phones are okay. But not, if you want to come out on time, it's not. They're okay. If you want to come out on time. I want to take this call from Nelson. He's been waiting a long while. Go ahead to Frank Walden and Lloyd Ingram. Hello. Am I the one that's talking? You are. Okay. Um, I'm just one of the general public, and I feel that there must be a better way than strikes, because we're the ones who get kicked in the teeth, and they're the ones who get the benefits. But when you ask these gentlemen, uh, are they afraid of a referendum on a right to vote? On a right to work, rather. Afraid? He's asking you. Uh, but that's got nothing to do with a post office strike, has it? Where are you? Where am I? Yeah, that's got nothing to do with the, the uh, with the postal strike, has it? Yes, it has. I would like to know uh, why we have to be inconvenienced by a strike. Okay, Frank, you'll have to give the man a little lecture, won't you? Well, the, the, right the, the, right to st the right to work, well, the, the right to work uh, is uh, uh, deteriorate uh, something that will deteriorate the unions. Uh, that's that's what right to work is. It's the wrong terminology, actually. Right to work. Uh, He's but trying to ask you in a clumsy kind of way if in another occasion you'd like to see a referendum throughout the nation on whether or not we should have right to work legislation. Well, 
I'm not going to make any comment on that situation. That's too oh, oh boy, I'll comment. Will you, you comment on I sure will comment. I certainly wouldn't. It's not the right to work. It's the right to work for less. Mm -hmm. Let's look at the, the states in the United States that have it, the southern states. Look at the conditions down there. Look at the rates of pay. Well, uh, that, that answers your question, I think. To be quite undeceptive on myself, the right to work would be a step back, but it would be very difficult to achieve in this country after the union organization over the past 50 years. Exactly. Maybe only a real depression would bring it. Okay, who is next? Go ahead, please. Uh, hello. Um, you were talking about earlier about the young people being fed up with unions, and I'm one of those young people. I'm in the 23 age group and my question to these men is we hear what they want but how do they pr propose to make the post office more efficient help out unemployment and really get down and do some grassroots things they they just seem to be quibbling like a bunch of old maids well no you're negotiating in the traditional fashion and this young guy is asking you should you be involved in the management of the post office on a worker director basis that's really not certainly not at the present time how could we, if we, have an, we have an employer who doesn't, he refuses to negotiate with us. He, he, we can't impose our right to negotiate. Yeah, but would you like some form of worker participation in the efficiency of the post office? Industrial democracy? Yeah. At the present time, certainly not. Too, be, too big a mess. Exactly. Frank? Yes, uh, not, not only that, but uh, the Canadian Union of Postal Workers have taken a stand that we will not participate in any of the industrial democracy at the present time. The, first of all, that we have to get the wages and our working conditions for the membership in there, and management have to clean up their own problems there. Try a call from Prince George. Go ahead, please. Yes, I'm, I, I'm with the boys there and their strike uh, order to go on straight because uh, I think they uh, deserve what they're asking, and uh, for years and years and years they've always monkeyed around with the post office and made them wait for union contracts, and by the time they get it signed it runs out, and, and then they make them wait another two years before they uh, start to bargain again for... I gather you're with the union all the way. I'm with them all the way. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Yes, Jack. I'm calling from Maple Ridge. Uh-huh. And uh, my complaint is that they're calling for higher wages. Now, I'm a senior citizen, and I have found a lot of trouble with the mail service in Maple Ridge. In fact, they lost three years ago my mail, including my pension check. Well, that can happen every now and again, but that surely isn't a problem of the, the union officials and who are faced with a strike this weekend or next weekend. The point is, Jack, uh, under our wages that we get, and you consider what they're getting, we cause our cost of living is just the same as theirs. Well, they don't get quite as much as some of the provincial government employees, do you, Frank? That's right. No, you can't compare apples and oranges, unsympathetic though it may sound. Go ahead, please. Yes, Mr. Walden and his uh, other union counterparts with, uh, with other unions, have, have he ever considered not taking a paycheck along with the workers? I think that strikes would be of shorter duration. Okay, okay, sure. just let me ask that question. If you go out on strike next week, will the union officials like yourself still draw their pay? No, we will not, Jack. We do not receive any uh, paychecks. We get the strike pay as same as the members do. Well, that's fair enough. Quite clear. If they go out and strike, you go out and strike with them, and you only draw strike pay hey, if and a, when you qualify. Yeah, I do not get any check. How much have you got in the National Strike Fund? Um, that I won't announce in the air. We have we have money there, but you don't can't tell me what the strike pay might be. What no. was the last time? Well, last time I can't 40, remember. Forty dollars a week. I think. About forty, 40 dollars a week. week. Okay, like okay. Go ahead, please. Yes. Um, I, have a, I know that the situation is very complex between the two parties involved in this case, but what I would like to say is there's a whole public out there, Canadian citizens, who have to tolerate this kind of situation, and it seems to happen yearly, it seems to, to me. What, or if, if anything, could be done, or have the unions exploited every other possibility before going to strike action? How about it? In, in the, the last 18, the what he's saying is, in the last 18 months, what have you done? What have we done? Mm -hmm. To try and make a settlement with the post office. We've presented Negotiation 77, as we call it, the most comprehensive 
document that's ever been presented to a conciliation board. We've waited. The conciliation board was agreed to in November of 77. It wasn't established until April 10, 78. We've taken 18 months for nothing. The press the other day, quick action by cabinet could avert mail strike. Our national president has said, give us somebody with the authority to negotiate. We'll sit down and negotiate. We're flexible. Maybe what you need is Bryce McKessie back. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> now, did Kurtemans not take most of the hot potatoes and divorce them from his, from his conciliation board report? He, had, he divorced uh, 12 items, which he could have made there, but he made no recommendation on 12 items. None at all? None at all. Simple things like vacation leave, preferred assignments, holidays, statutory holidays, um, dental insurance plans, uh, work in the bargaining unit. Those are just some of those. He absolutely made no re recommendations on those. He referred them back to the parties. All he had to do was to go to the act, uh, to the act there, where it spells out what vacation leave you can get as a minimum. It spells out what statutory holidays you can get. And he didn't even take that time out. He referred those items back to the parties after 18 months. So from your point of view, Court to Mines was just a stall and a waste of time. Waste of time. He wasted, he wasted awesome. everybody's time and a lot of money. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, hold on, please. Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, Jack, I'm on handicap pension. I get less than $300 a month. I'm 100% behind these men. Uh, $6 or $7 an hour is not enough. And I don't think that they should uh, uh, have to uh, go, go without because I am trying to live on $300 a month. I'm not a greedy person, and I feel that these men are underpaid, definitely underpaid, and pushed around too much. Thank you, Jack. Thank you very much. You, you say the basic pay at the moment, roughly speaking, is around $6.36 an hour. No, uh, I think it would average out to around six uh, twenty-nine because there's different rates for the different classifications. You make me a, a make a line of me for seven cents. About six dollars and thirty cents an hour. Okay. Is that, from your point of view, a, a living wage in this day and age? Certainly, wide cer certainly not. Not Thank at the rate of inflation. No, it's it's certainly not a living wage. But there's one thing that uh, that the public must understand that in the post office or in the federal government. There is an 8.3% taken off for the superannuation that's compulsory. There's the death benefit plan, which is compulsory. There's the UIC, and, there's, and all of those things are compulsory off there, uh, the superannuation. Now, with a 50% turnover in the, uh, the membership in the, the post offices, these young people are getting, getting this 8.3% superannuation taken off. All they do when they quit, they all they do is get their own money back again. That's it. But mm -hmm. that check is all that money off of their paycheck. So that's a lot of money. Fair off. enough, Frank. We'll know. Thanks to Frank Walton and Lloyd Ingram, we'll know when. We'll know sometime Monday what's going to happen, or whether or not you people are going to defy a potential law, go out and strike, or maybe even not go out and strike. Eh? We'll know that Monday sometime. Monday sometime. Yes, that's right, Chuck. Thanks, Frank. Thanks, Lloyd. Thank you, Chuck. Webster, after these messages. Open his mic. And I'll, I'll make an obvious chew for, for Rathi when I come to it. She, I'll make an obvious... My opening will be, let's see. As a person with some considerable experience in presenting uh, both sides of labor disputes to the public over a large number of years, I think it does some good uh, to have Frank Walden and Lloyd Ingram here. And the thing that really depresses me about this whole postal mishmash, apart from the obvious problems they've had with automation and technical change and the rest of it, is that they have been in negotiations for 18 months. Now, who allowed that to happen? How can the, one of the busiest government departments, the post office, allow, or a cabinet, allow an 18-month lag in negotiations? It's quite unforgivable. If they're not going to give them any money, they can make up their mind on that surely in six weeks or a month. 
The point is that the government is quite directionless in what it's trying to do to save the economy, and they don't want to give any kind of increase to postal workers because they're on their big spending save. But the basic, there are two basic faults in this dispute. One was the government that gave them the right to strike. Don't want them to strike, they shouldn't have given them the right to strike in the first place. And secondly, 18 months is a damnable period of time to put a union, its membership and the country through on negotiations. One last little postscript for the week. The other night I went up to the MPA after Rathi ran in and was going to run. Remember I had him on in the morning and I covered him at night the other night. Let's now see the remarks that caused him to cut his throat politically. Let's see them. I want to see the necessity for Vancouver to get better leadership than we've been having in the past. I'm quite convinced, and I didn't come out and say so with regard to the aldermen here tonight, but they're a pretty weak, sickly bunch, aren't they? Now, how can you be elected mayor and work with some of that weak, sickly bunch? Well, I, I found this, that a strong leader can lead a council, and a weak leader gets absolutely nowhere with a strong council or a weak council. In other words, as a strong mayor, you could read that, lead that weak, sickly bunch run by the nose. <laughs> no. I wouldn't like to put it by the nose, but what you really do is you uh, give leadership, uh, you, you put conversation together, that it, in fact... Weak, sickly bunch by the nose. By the nose, my words. Having said that, he had to pull out, it would seem to me. Pity, a good guy, Rathi. Linda, Monday morning. Joe Filipponi, Monday Ooh. morning. Joe Filipponi. Joe Filipponi, <laughs> Monday morning, with Webster at 9 a.m. precisely. <laughs>